1 Corinthians chapter 1, we, you, have been in a series. Pastor Santino picked up the first two parts of this series, and uh, I want to finish it tonight. And it's, it's, the series is called God Chose You. Amen. Look at somebody and just tell them God chose you. All right, now put your hand on your, your chest and just say, God chose me. Amen. All right. Let's go to verse 26. Say amen if you have it. <clears throat> Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify or literally to destroy the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. It is because of him. Everybody say it's because of him. That you are in Christ Jesus. Just say that with me. It is because of God that I'm in Christ Jesus. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, verse 31, or so then, therefore, or literally, this is our reason to boast. Watch. As it is written, or as it is recorded, let him who boasts, or who brags, boast, or take pride in the Lord. Hallelujah. God, we thank you for your word. Cause it to do exactly what you've intended for it to do, to serve its purpose as we serve your purpose by your spirit. For your glory, in Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. All right. All right. We're going to wrap this thing up that we've been in. Say, God chose me. Look at somebody one more time. Just tell them God chose you. All right. The Bible is clear. If you read the book of Corinthians, they had a lot of trouble. How many of you know the, the church in Corinth, if you've read anything about them, they were not perfect in any way, shape, or form. They had some mess going on in that church on many levels. There was immorality in the church operating. There was confusion. They were abusing the gifts of the Spirit. They were abusing the Lord's Supper. Uh, it, just, it was just a real mess. And Paul had a lot of straightening out to do. So the Corinthian Christians were living proof that salvation does not depend on anything but a true knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, you need to understand that salvation, your redemption, your holiness, your righteousness, your justification, all of those things that God does, doesn't depend on you. They were well aware of the fact, based on what Paul was telling them and teaching them, that they could not manufacture their own deliverance. I just want you to lift your hand with me and say, I cannot deliver myself. myself. Look at your neighbor and tell him, you can't deliver me. You might be a nice person, but you can't deliver me. No, he made it clear that the redeemed, or those who have been purchased, who have been bought, are given salvation by divine wisdom rather than their own. There's nothing you can do, there's nothing you can think of, there's no program, there's no mechanism that you can organize, nothing you can develop, there is no wisdom that you can draw from in any way, shape, or form that will cause you to be saved. Only divine wisdom is the source of your salvation. Uh, I, I, I say this a lot, that, that the gospel, the good news, is divine wisdom because the gospel didn't come from you the good news didn't come from you you didn't write it you didn't create it you didn't script it out you didn't have a good idea and say you know what i i i got this great idea called the gospel 
No, it comes from God. Matter of fact, there is no gospel aside from the gospel that comes from God. It is impossible to have gospel without God. It is impossible to have gospel without Jesus being the center of the gospel. Because the gospel means good news. The term the gospel means, it's the Greek word euangelion. I'll spell it for you. E-U-A-N-G-E-L-I-O-N. I'll spell it again. E-U, I'm tired. A-N-G-E-L-I-O-N. Euangelion. The gospel. It lit- it's where we get the word uh, evangel or evangelistic, uh, the euangelion, the source of truth, the source of life, the source of eternal life. All of it comes from God. And so Paul makes it clear. He tells them very, very clearly that the gospel does not pen- depend on them. It, become- it comes from God. There, therefore, is what? There's no room. Paul makes it clear in, this, in these verses. There's no room for man to boast. None. There's nothing that any of us can do and say, well, you know what? I got here by, by, by my own wit, by my own will, my own whim. I, I pulled myself up spiritually by my own bootstraps. You know, I, I, I achieved There is not one person in the world who has ever saved themselves. I don't care how holy you think you are or how holy you think somebody else is. There is no one who has ever, ever been able to save themselves. You cannot deliver yourself. You cannot save yourself. You read this Bible a thousand times. You can't save yourself because you read it. Are you hearing me tonight? There's only one source of our salvation. And it is the gospel of God in Christ Jesus. So there's no room for any man to boast. Instead of boasting, instead of boasting, redeemed people must realize that salvation is all from God's grace. Grace is the ultimate source of salvation. Where does my salvation come from? It comes from the grace of God. It comes from the mercy of God. It comes from the love of God. Manifested how? Demonstrated how? In and through Christ Jesus. He is the manifestation of God's love. Everything about him, what he did for us, tells us what? That God loved us. He went to the cross. Why? Because as we said just a bit ago, love is demonstrative. Jesus didn't just stand around and say, you know what? Love you. How you doing? Love you. No. He said, I love you and I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm going to go to the cross of Calvary and I'm going to give my life. And so you and I as redeemed people must realize that salvation is all from God's grace. When Paul says, therefore, in verse 31, as it is written, say as it is written. He says, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Well, where is it written? Whenever you find that in the Bible, when it says, as it is written, Find out where it's written. Now, thankfully, our Bibles have little footnotes. Your Bible should have a, a little letter there. Mine does. It says, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And it has a little A. Well, go down to the bottom of your page. It should have it there. And it refers you to what? Verse 31 in here refers you to Jeremiah 9.24. So let's go to Jeremiah 9.24. Let's, Paul, let's find out what Paul was referring to when he says, At, as it is written. Jeremiah 9 and 24. Jeremiah 9, 24 says this. But let him who boasts, boast about this. Doesn't that sound just like what we read? Paul said, let him who boasts, boast about this. So he's really echoing Jeremiah. He says, let him who boasts, boast about this. That he understands and knows me. 
that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. Now that was 660 years before Paul reiterated it. But it took Jesus to come and demonstrate what Jeremiah was prophesying. Let him boast about this, that he knows me. You can't know God apart from Jesus. You can't understand who God is in any way, shape, or form without the revelation of the gospel of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, all right, now here, we've come full circle. This is what this is all about. Our boasting is going to be in one thing and one thing alone, the gospel of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. So there's no room to boast. All salvation is from God's grace. The message of the cross, because Paul talks about this thing being foolish. He uses the foolish thing to confound or to shame the wise. The weak thing to shame the strong. Well, what's foolish? The cross is foolish. Think about it. I got this plan. I'm going to send my son and he's going to hang on a cross. And then the whole world's going to be saved. I, I, you know, if, if I was going to come up with a, with a plan, I, I think I'd try and come up with something else. It's ludicrous. Why? Because in the natural realm, uh, you know, the, 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 the victor should come forth on a great white horse and, 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 and come with a massive army and, and slaughter all of the enemies and, and enact salvation and restore everything. And that's what the Jews were expecting from the Messiah. But no, God says, no, no, no. I'm going to take my son and I'm going to hang him on the cross. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus was cursed for you and for me. And the whole means of salvation was wrought on the cross of Calvary. Why? Because when Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary, what happened? All of your sin, all of my sin, all of the shame of the world was put on Christ. That's kind of a, a in, in man's eyes, in man's understanding, in man's assessment. Man says, that's foolish. That's not a good plan. And God says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You couldn't come up with this if you, to save your life. And guess what? We can't. And so it's clear that the foolishness of the cross is foolish only to men. Not only that, is it foolish in the eyes of men, but its messengers are considered foolish as well. I want you to say messenger. Yes. What's a messenger? Messenger is somebody that carries a message. Well, guess what? You are a messenger. Now, I'm a, I'm a preacher and I've been one for a long time. And I've had people call me foolish and I've had people, you know, call me just, you know, uh, naive and all kinds of things. You know, but that's okay. I don't, that don't bother me. You understand? So the world looks at messengers as foolish. The world looks at preachers as foolish. But the moment you open your mouth and you start talking about the gospel of God in Christ Jesus and that he is the only way. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the light. The minute you start talking like that, not only do people think that you're, you're foolish, but they get mad at you. Because they say, oh, no, no, no. That's not inclusive. That's exclusive. There's many ways to God. Well, we found out not too long ago, we reiterated the fact that there is only one way. When we did that series called The Way. He's, he's the only way to God. He's the only way for the, that curtain to have been torn into from top to bottom that we preached about. So we understand very clearly that there is only one message. Make that clear in your mind. Don't ever allow yourself to think that there's more than one message. Don't let anybody ever twist you or turn you or put you in a, in a place where you feel, listen to me, where you feel compelled to buy off on somebody else's nonsense. Or to agree with them just because you don't want to argue. 
or agree with them because you don't want them to think you're stupid or foolish or short-sighted or narrow-minded. No, you stand for what you believe. You stand for what you know is right. You stand as the redeemed of the Lord and you say, no, my Bible says. My Bible says. And I say, because God said, that there is only one gospel. There's no such thing called the gospel of Buddha. There's no such thing called the gospel of Krishna. There's no such thing called the gospel of Muhammad. There is no such thing. Why? Because you cannot have gospel without God. You cannot have gospel without Jesus. You can't have good news without Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. There is no gospel aside from the gospel of Christ. God has arranged it then so that our salvation. Anybody saved in here? Amen. Come on, if you're saved, say hallelujah. hallelujah. God is, has arranged it so that our salvation promotes a glorification of the God who saved us. Your salvation doesn't, doesn't glorify you. You might have a glorious testimony. I do. I have an amazing testimony. But so do you. Amen. Okay, some of you believe it. I said, but so do you. Yes. But it's designed in such a way where it cannot in any way, shape, or form glorify you. The only, the only time that a testimony is going to be able to, quote, glorify, if you will, to use that term very, very figuratively and very loosely, is during the tribulation when the tribulation saints will have to achieve their salvation by believing that Jesus is the Messiah. The Jew will have to say he is the Messiah and they'll be killed for it. That's why it says they overcome by their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. They'll be martyred. That's why that verse has nothing to do with you or me. No, your salvation, your testimony doesn't glorify you. It can't. It only glorifies one thing and one source and one person. It glorifies God. God gets all the glory for your testimony. God said, I'm going to fix it in such a way that you cannot get not even one ounce, not one iota, not one drop of glory for this thing. Because everything that happened in you, I did. Everything that happened to pull you out of hell and bring you into heaven, I did it. You cannot take any credit for your salvation. You cannot even take credit for having a revelation of, of the awareness of the fact that you needed to be saved. When I knew I needed to be saved and cried out for salvation, it was because God revealed to me what I was. He revealed to me that I was lost and I was on my way to hell. That I was a sinner and that I was going to spend eternity outside of heaven. I was going to pay for my sins. Man, when I saw that, I was like, oh, God, save me. Everything I'd done up, in, up to that point in my life was all about me. But when I hit that, 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 that definitive moment, there was nothing I could do that would glorify myself. It was all God. Amen. And so God has, has, has arranged it in such a way that our own salvation promotes the glory of God who saved us rather than pride in our own efforts which we know could have never delivered us how many of you know as good as you tried to be you tried to be a good Baptist or a good Catholic or you tried to be a good whatever you tried to be how many of you know that couldn't save you how many of you that re religion cannot save you you can be a good Pentecostal and not be saved hello somebody I know a lot of them. I was one. Didn't save me. No. There's only one thing that saves you. It's Jesus Christ and the finished work on the cross of Calvary. So you and I need to understand very, very clearly 
make it, make it very, very clear. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. That we cannot boast in anything other than God. Because we could have never delivered ourselves. Now let me just ask that, that question one more time. Anybody ever tried to be so good that you thought you might be saved because you're a good guy, a good gal? You yeah, you found that it doesn't work. We can only boast in God. We have no strength. We have no righteousness of which to boast. If I thought I was strong enough to deliver myself, I found that I wasn't. If I thought that my own righteous acts, my good, th my good works, or trying to be a good guy, or try to do good things, if I thought that those things could save me, I found out that they couldn't. Because those things are nothing. They're immaterial. They run out. They, they, they're good once after you're saved. It's good, it's good to do good works after you're saved. And we're supposed to. Hello, somebody. I said, hello, somebody. We're supposed to. But those things cannot save you. And so we understand clearly, though, then that we can only boast in God. There's nothing of ourselves in which we can boast. We can only boast. Paul says it. In verse 31, therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We can only boast in the one who is full of goodness and mercy. Why? Because you, are not, you and I are not full of goodness and mercy in ourselves. We were at a deficit of goodness and mercy before Christ. We lived in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a negative balance of goodness and mercy before Jesus. So there wasn't enough goodness and mercy in any of us to save us. Paul says, make it clear. Don't forget this. Don't ever come to a place in your life. Watch this. Just because you've been saved 20 years, 25 years, because you do this or you do that, don't ever forget, don't ever twist it and come to a place in your own mind where you think, oh, you know what? I've been doing pretty good. Maybe I did kind of save myself. Maybe I did have something to do with this. Maybe my own good efforts and my own good thoughts and my own desires and my leaning toward God, all of those things, maybe they just kind of brought me to a place of salvation and, you know, I had the good sense to turn around and say amen. The devil is a liar. There was only one thing that caused you to turn. There was only one thing that caused you to have an awareness moment. There was only one thing that caused you to wake up and smell the coffee. And that was the grace of God in Christ Jesus. That was the Holy Ghost who said to you, you need to be saved. God redeemed us because he was able. He saved us because he was able. He saved us and he redeemed us out of the hand of the enemy. And that's the bottom line. How many of you know Satan had a hold on you and you could not get out? You couldn't set yourself free from drugs. You couldn't set yourself free from whatever had bound you, whatever um, ha had gripped you. You could not set yourself free. You tried. You tried. Whatever it was that held you, you tried to get out. Whether it was pride, whether it was arrogance, or whether it was your own uh, habits, whatever it was. You couldn't get, you, some, some people get saved, and when they get saved, they're so, they're so full of hate. And they can't deliver themselves out of hate. They can read all the, all the, 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 the books on, on loving people and being kind. You know what? They're still hateful. Still spiteful. But when the love of God appears in your heart, he fills you with a love that comes from him and him alone. And it changes everything. No, no, no. There's not one of us who were able to save ourselves or to redeem ourselves out of the hand of the enemy. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. You should know this scripture real, real well. For it is by grace that you have been saved. I, I, King James kind of makes me angry there because it says it's by grace that you are saved. No, no, I am saved, but I have been saved. NIV makes it very, very clear. It is by grace that you have been saved. I am saved because I've been saved. If I was saved yesterday, I am saved. If I was saved 35 years ago, I am saved. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. 
Doesn't say it by works. By good thoughts, by good deeds, by good efforts, by good desires, by being a good person. No, by faith. It is by grace that you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. Through faith. And this not from yourselves. In other words, faith didn't even come from you. You can't even take credit for having the ability to believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Well, the day I believed, hallelujah. I, no, 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 no. Because the faith to believe didn't come from you. God gave you the ability to say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. To every man, the Bible says, Paul says in Romans, every man has been given a measure, a quantity, and a portion, a, a, a amount of faith to do what with? To believe. Faith is the ability to believe. So there's nobody, watch this, there is nobody on the face of the earth who has ever lived or who will ever live or is living right now who's, who cannot say, who can say, oh, well, you know, I just can't believe. Oh, no, everybody can believe. Everybody believes something. But it's only when you put your faith in the work of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the finished work of Calvary on the cross. That's when your faith goes into the right place and accomplishes its purpose. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not from yourselves. What? It is the gift. It is the gift. Of God what's what's distinctive about a gift it's free you, you don't tell somebody here I'm giving you a gift now give me 20 bucks it's not a purchase you can't purchase salvation the gift that you received was purchased on the cross that's where it came from the only thing we can do is receive it how many of you like to receive gifts? Yes. Amen. The greatest gift you were ever given was the gift of salvation. It is the gift of God. Watch this. Not of works. Not of your effort. Not of your label, labor. Not, not of your good intentions. Not of your desire to be a good guy. Not of all the good things you might do. Be a philanthropist or trying to do good charity for whatever. Not of works. What? So that no one can boast. It is from God that we are. Who you are right now as a saved person comes from God. Everybody say, I'm from God. My salvation is from God. My status is from God. It is from God that you are who you are. That we have spiritual life. Because once before... We were spiritually, watch this, we were spiritually among the things which are not. Oh, God. We are, but we weren't. We weren't, but we are. At one point, we weren't saved. At one point, we were not redeemed. At one point, we were not justified. We were not sanctified. But God in Christ Jesus saved us and justified us and cleansed us and redeemed us and glorified us. So that now we are the thing we were not. That's really what it means when it's talking about when, when Paul says about Abraham, he says, and God calls those things which are not as though they were. So God had already planned your salvation. You didn't even plan your salvation. The day you came to church, the day you decided to accept Christ, or however your salvation experience took place, it wasn't because you thought you had a good idea. God gave you that idea. Well, you know what? I just had the good sense to go to church. No, you had the, the Holy Spirit calling you. Hey, get to the house of God. I'll never forget mine. I'll never forget it. Never. My mother thought she was, you know, the host of Let's Make a Deal. You know? 
if you go this one time, I'll never ask you to go again. And I said, I can do that. Get her off my back. She's been on my back for seven years. I can do that. Well, guess what? It wasn't even my mother's good idea. She probably got a revelation when she went to heaven about that one. No, it was God who told her, tell him, tell him. If he goes once, you'll never ask him to go again. My God, that's good. So that we are what we were not. But God called us as though we were. So that we would be. God didn't choose people whose only interest is in this world. To publish the gospel of grace. No. God chose you. God chose people who would experience the power of the cross. God chose people who would experience and know the grace and the mercy of God to do what? And to be what? To be messengers of the cross of Christ Jesus. This whole series has been God chose you. Well, tonight, no, for a certainty, would be beyond a shadow of a doubt, you have been chosen by God. You've been grafted into Christ Jesus. You believe that he's our only righteousness, that he is the one and the only ground of our justification, our right standing with and in God. You know and I know that he has delivered us from evil and that he's given us eternal life. And we've been chosen Everybody say, I'm chosen. chosen. Grab somebody, just tell them you're chosen. You and I have been chosen to know, watch this, the privilege, the privilege of boasting in Christ. Amen. I want you to exercise your privilege tomorrow. Privileges are to be exercised, aren't they? Amen. I got a right to do something. I have, a, I have the right to exercise my privilege. Amen. You're a free person. You go where you want. You're privileged to do this. You're privileged to do that. And you exercise it freely. And no one can stop you because you're free to do that. Well, guess what? You have a privilege of being able to share the gospel of Christ with somebody tomorrow. Amen. Amen. Will you exercise your privilege you have a privilege of boasting in Christ. Amen. Not about yourself. Right. Not about you. Amen. It's all about Him. Amen. Stand to your feet. God, thank you for choosing us. Thank you for choosing us to not only to know you, but being able to boast about you. So cause us, I pray. Enable us, I pray. Remind us, I pray. Quicken us, I pray. To exercise our privilege of boasting about you. Because it is only in you that we have any right to boast. And it is you who receives all of the glory. And all of the honor and all of the praise. Bless your people, I pray tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen.